hello everyone good morning good afternoon good evening wherever you're dialing from welcome back again for those who have been joining our thought leadership sessions week after week and today a very interesting topic uh, future of the work where we will be discussing about the impact of ai in automation for the future organizations and individuals big topic but important topic because right now every, everybody is working from home right so i'm i'm in my bedroom uh, and then i think most of us are in bedroom or, or drawing room wherever they are and same for i'm guessing for the audience so the future work i don't think anybody want to be this one but the future work which we will be discussing more about the technical impact of ai and automation any other emerging technology my thoughts on the future of the work uh, right now if you, if you look into which generation we are right now right so this is me generation x i got my mobile in first mobile 2003 uh, then we have generation y and then right now generation z we're talking about potentially will be working maybe with ar vr right i must i i was in my daughter she is just little over seven year old she talks about sensors she is talking about how to build a smart bins which which can help to detect so that people do not throw the fish uh, rubbish in the in the bin by mistake so system should detect how to to identify the person who is doing deliberately or by by a mistake right so people in gen z like like my daughter uh, i think we don't know how they will be working together right so example of how the how amazon transformed from a simple website to a, so now we can order our milk and potatoes or, or eggs through alexa right? the future of the work future of the generation of the individual is very difficult to predict you can observe you can you can foresee but it is really hard personally even though i'm a technological architect when my daughter goes to university in 2030 uh, how this will look like right the idea is as organization there used to be a very hierarchical organizations today we are talking about being distributed but how the organization of the future will look like right so i don't think there will be any boss it's pretty much we talk about gig economy we talk about uh, skills based organization and and the uh, same we apply also in all things connected so we don't have like a lot of full time expert but we have we have very specialized expert who we bring on board or on project to project basis right so how your organization in the future will look like right similarly for the individuals right so we need to look at what are the skills we need to drive individually as well as in the organization as a leader is something we look at so the idea is because uh, uh, we are right now getting more automation cobots but i don't think we want to be in this situation right <laughs> so the future work i don't think we want to be in this mode uh, in fact means i was reading an article this morning that uh, i think it was on harvard uh, there's there's no retirement age right now so while we're talking about automation at the same time we're talking about retirement how the future of individual look like is difficult to predict right? in today's session there's no better than neha who should be orchestrating this the topic of the future of work over to you neha thank you thank you so much ck a warm welcome to all of you in today's session on future of work and impact of ai and automation future of work is no more in future it is today in the past six months since COVID-19 outbreak began, workplaces have changed in unprecedented ways. An intelligence-based technological movement that should take at least a decade from now to manifest took only months to manifest. AI algorithms and automation form the core of virtual world of today and future workplaces. AI offers tremendous computational power decision-making power with precision and accuracy, much more advanced than any human capacity. For example, Google's DeepMind Autonomous AI beat the world's best Go player. And recently, Alibaba's algorithm have been shown to be superior even in reading and comprehensions. Some skills like reading and comprehension comprehensions are the basic skills that belong to intelligent species like humans. At work, there are algorithms intelligent enough to recruit new staff, decide which employee to promote, and even manage a wide range of administrative, strategic, and decision-making tasks. More intelligent surveillance is expected as well, 
For example, JP Morgan Chase uses algorithms to track employees and access whether or not they are in line with companies' compliance regulations. Companies have set up enable and enabled algorithms to track how satisfied employees feel in their in order to predict whether they will they are going to leave the organization or not and all of this is happening today so in today's session our distinguished speakers will share with us more insights and current knowledge how big industry players like dell and mercer strategize ai and automation to their competitive advantage we will also zoom out a little bit and see how AI and automation impact is impacting labor market as a whole. So without further ado, let me introduce our distinguished speakers for today's session. Uh, Ms. Sara Chiu, Sara is Singapore public sector leader and job redesign practice leader for Mercer, Mercer where she focuses on future of work topics such as workforce planning, job redesign, talent redevelopment and skills for the future. She is currently second to the World Economic Forum at Hello for the for preparing for future of work initiative based in Geneva. So welcome Sara. Our next speaker will be Eckhard Ernst, in, who is uh, Chief of Microeconomic Policies and Jobs Unit at International Labor Organization. He is an expert on impact of technological change and macro policies on productivity, employment, wages, and inequality. So his current focus lies on understanding trends in the future of work. Our last uh, speaker will be uh, Ms. Uh, she is an extra. Jogana is passionate about delivering superior customer experiences through new technologies and uh, that lead to digital transformation and enhanced human experiences. She is a tech, uh, she is technological savvy business leader with proven abilities to successfully explain and align complex technology solutions with business outcomes. So with such distinguished speakers, I'm very happy to start today's session and a uh, very warm welcome to Sara, Eckhart and Jagana. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, now I would like to um, invite Sara to begin the session with her insights on future of work and AI. Um, so Niha has um, you know, really given me a very, very great introduction. So my name is Sarah. I'm very passionate about job redesign um, because of its application to create a productive and inclusive workforce. Um, a lot of my most gratifying moments in consulting is to really look at ways to help workers automate their work processes using technology. And um, at times when you help uh, an employee save 40% or 50% of their time of the day, um, it's always a very nice feeling. So I will actually want to begin um, our conversation on a, um, a video on future of work and note that this is produced by Deloitte and it was actually produced um, three years ago. Imagine the future of work. What do you see? Do you see factories full of robots and offices teaming with AI? Do you predict that changing demographics will rewrite the rules of who works and how long? Do you anticipate the rise of a global gig economy where most people are working for themselves? All of these scenarios are emerging. Looking at them in isolation misses the point. We need to zoom out and see the big picture. Evolving technology, demographics, and power dynamics are all connected. And those connections make all the difference in the future of work. If intelligent machines can do many tasks now performed by people, what uniquely human skills will be valued? If the half-life of skills necessary for employment continues to dwindle, how can individuals, employers, and society as a whole ensure the learning modules and the education system keep up? As the global workforce gets older, younger, and more diverse, how will leaders and organizational culture have to adapt? Alternative work arrangements like short-term gigs and self-employment become more ubiquitous and mainstream. Could that have profound effects on not just how we work, but where we work, how we communicate, and even how cities are designed? 
Augmented reality gives workers access to vast amounts of data and assistance. Will workers need to become more tech fluent for the technology to deliver on its promise? The future of work is coming. In some cases, it's already here. And if we were to fast forward the timeline by three years with the pandemic hitting us by surprise, the major themes relating to future of work stays largely the same. If you were to think about it, our interest in technology and automation has increased. Um, businesses are looking to automate for the humans and at the same time requiring us to perform with new skill sets. Um, so referring to that graphic CK had just shared on you know, robots replacing humans, um, a lot of times as we think about the job redesign journey with clients, um, when we speak to workers, the, the very fear that they, they share with us or the questions that we are often um, asked is, are you going to replace me by, you know, with a robot? Um, maybe yes, maybe no. But I think that the point that we often have yet to really talk about and think about is despite technology having um, the effect of alleviating our workload and reducing the time we need to work, it really does not mean it will replace humans in entirety. It's quite not possible at this point in time. Um, if we were to look at some numbers, a report we produced by the World Economic Forum back in 2018, even though it's likely to impact 75 million jobs worldwide, at the same time, 113 million jobs will emerge with technology. So um, the net effect is still 58 million jobs being created. The question here is really how do we think about evolving alongside with technology so that we stay relevant? The other two themes we see in the video here, it's the piece around multi-generation workforce. Um, CK also spoke about that. We are now having a large number of generation and workforce from baby boomers to Gen Z. How do we think about ways to work with them in a way that is inclusive and also best harness their various abilities? Um, the, the third piece on gig economy is still very much focused in today's conversation. If anything, it has elevated um, as we look to augment our workforce with gig workers, either for their technical subject matter expertise or to lean on flexible work workforce to help the business manage um, search during peak seasons. So the pandemic has got us focused and thinking harder about the future of work, what this means to any organizations or us as individuals. However, as we start thinking about the future of work, we also need to first understand the future of the business. So if we were to really um, reflect on some of the trends we have seen during and post pandemic, first of all, I've been very impressed by how quickly organizations adapted and showcase our ability to innovate at rapid pace um, and by also leveraging their existing capabilities. If you were to look at um, high-end fashion retailer Louis Vuitton, they started using their fragrance facilities to produce hand sanitizers instead of perfumes um, to help increase the, the, the supply of hand sanitizers. Sets Limited in Singapore started using their central kitchen facilities to prepare meals for healthcare workers and mig migrant workers instead of the airlines. Um, we, we were actually left with no choice but to turn into remote working almost immediately, which stress tests the resilience of our business operating models. And at the same time, we are also studying the impact of other businesses within the entire ecosystem, such as businesses that are dependent on office work, and I'm referring to, say, smaller F&B businesses or dry cleaning services that are situated at prime business locations. Um, the future of these businesses is uncertain because it is dependent on how remote working situation evolves. And as such, we see organizations moving into uh, and operating on a survival mode. Um, we are seeing um, you know, a lot of strict, stringent um, cost containment measures, delaying non-critical capital expenditure, right-sizing pay cuts, furloughs and layoffs coming, um, if not already. And the last piece is very similar to what we've spoken about earlier. Um, organizations are a lot more motivated to accelerate technology uptake as compared to in the past. There are less resistance. And as such, we can expect that the design of our jobs will change faster as technology frees up time for other activities and requiring us to reskill. So 
And as we move on to really understand the impact on you and I as individuals, um, if we were to just reflect on ourselves, think about the amount of changes that has been imposed on us within a very short time frame. We quickly adapted to remote working. We had to adapt with how we work at home with loved ones and colleagues. We need to rethink about how we engage clients and customers and yet work towards the same type of outcomes we have originally set ourselves for. Um, the conditions had changed so much and yet we need to then worry about broader economic impact on our job security, our financial security, and definitely physical as well. Um, you know, thinking about health and wellness, uh, the exposure to virus, and also the additional mental stress that one has to undertake. Um, whilst going through all of the changes we just spoke about, um, we also start to understand that the digitalization trend is here to stay. Um, our employers will continue to intensify technology adoption and business remodeling, and we need to also quickly adapt in order to sustain and contribute. So from a um, employment perspective, some of the pre-COVID trends re remain, such as a pursuit of for meaningful work beyond pay. We can see that employees are expecting their organizations to be accountable for broader responsibilities beyond profitability of the organization. So we're speaking about environment, social and governance responsibilities. Um, I do think we look forward to more transparency on decision making and being able to perform in an open, open and inclusive work environment. So with what we have just discussed as the backdrop, and we are in all things connected workshops. So to help us navigate the new world of work, we need to review and reconnect the six topics here, um, um, which I'll cover more in, in detail as we move on. So the first piece on technology adoption and skills, with technology being the key enabler for the business, many organizations are turning to, to it to expand current operations or simplify processes. Um, either way, it will significantly change the way we perform our current jobs. And when adopting technology, we do need to be clear about the problems we are trying to solve for the organization, such as, you know, think about how do we go about reviewing existing models and processes and identifying new potential opportunities. Uh, definitely leverage on data to understand what processes that are traditional laborious and manual, explore ways to then automate um, and to save time. So at the same time, um, when we think about tech changes, it may at times be very overwhelming because you are reviewing the entire process chain or value chain. Um, look out for quick wins to help you gain some footing in the automation journey. So um, in some parts of our work with our clients, as we look into job redesign, we look for very specific tasks that's been very manual and time consuming and painful. Um, we install very simple solutions to help people appreciate that automation is not always a scary process. Um, you know, it's aimed to alleviate rather than to disrupt. So for example, we have worked with um, a small retailer back in Singapore, and we noticed that their call center associate spends half of a day just calling every single customer to confirm furniture delivery appointments. And all we realized that what we had to do is to just switch into a text automation process. We completely save 40% of our time on a daily basis. It simplified the customer engagement process. And we could then, you know, kind of get the customer service associates to pick up new skill sets. So as you work towards transforming or automating a process, concurrently think about new skill sets that are required of your employees, help them understand the rationale for change, provide them with the necessary support to transit them into the new world. I highly, highly recommend um, involving um, the employees in the entire work redesign process right at the start. Um, in our experience, this is always the critical success factor. Employees who perform the, the, the task on a regular basis, they really know what needs to be fixed, but at times they're not given the air time to, to share it. So, and this also instilled the process redesign ownership on the employee, which usually results in higher buy-in, smoother execution, and also more natural transition in the process. 
And moving on to the next point on remote working, prior to the pandemic, only 50% of, 50 of organizations out there provide remote or flexible working options. And, and um, Mercer, we conducted um, a flexible work study back in 2018. What we learned was that one in three flexible work requests were actually being turned down by employers. So, however, through the cost of COVID, um, we know that organizations have switched into 100% remote and there are organizations leaning towards the idea that working from home option is here to stay. Um, we were left with no choice, but we transited very quickly. At present stage, we are still observing the impact such as on productivity and employee morale of remote working. Um, some of us are learning how to do that effectively, like how to carve out separate time and how to balance the actual workload. So for organizations moving back to the new normal, take time to realign and understand what the post-pandemic business state is and holistically assess if roles in your organization can be converted into permanent work from home models. This may in turn reduce real estate costs. Um, it also erases the physical or geographical limits we have traditionally imposed on ourselves. You no longer need to hire from a location within a specific physical radius from your office. Um, your access to talent has widened significantly with remote working as an option. And likewise, this trend will apply for job seekers as this widens your employment opportunities beyond your typical locations. Um, and with an unprecedented proportion of the workforce moving into remote working, um, this is probably the most challenging period for those who have leadership or managerial responsibilities. On top of the typical day-to-day -day work, um, the leaders are thinking about the long-term viability of their businesses and teams, strategizing new ideas, trying and testing new ideas. Um, the one thing that we no longer have is the access to the general vibe, entering the meeting room or observing the work momentum in the office to manage workload or employees. So we now need to think about new ways to manage the team and business effectively to get things done and to also maintain the engagement of employees during this exceedingly difficult period. So employees are experiencing so much more emotions during this period. Some might be experiencing grief due to COVID, um, isolation, additional stress, burnout, because we are still learning about how to manage workload and also the piece around um, the future uncertainty. So it's important that we keep the morale and engagement well during this period. It's difficult to get to a high morale. Um, if let, if let, let our manage, um, you know, it could lead to longer term issues post COVID reco recovery. So we have seen organizations increasing efforts um, on their employee listening exercise. They either launch more surveys to understand the general sentiment or to collect feedback. And um, we also see leaders um, increasing the number of town halls, daily briefs, and um, look for ways to engage colleagues more often on a one-on-one -on -one basis so that there's a chance to hear from the employees personally. I think the key here is to conduct open, transparent, and compassionate conversations during this period. Um, CK spoke a little bit about this. Um, it's likely that traditional chunky command and control type of organization is losing its effectiveness and possibly not the best structure if remote working is here to stay. So the market clients and employees do expect us to react faster, quicker as we adapt in the new economy. So we do expect to see a rise of informal agile project team structure. And, um, and this actually does promote cross-function collaboration and learning, reduces the typical silos we had in traditional organizations. Um, and as we move towards more fluid work environment, it's likely that we are hiring individuals for their skill sets as opposed to hiring them to fit into a box um, within a structure. Um, I do think this would be a draw for, for the small medium enterprises um, and you know they should leverage that a lot more because they are likely to have less structure today. They are, you know, easy, it's easier for them to quickly deploy people to work in smaller project teams across function. The takeaway for large organizations is to really move towards um, empowering and decentralized decision making models which may take time to build. And a topic that's really close to that is the piece around gig workforce as the future talent source. Um, it is reported that um, 
the gig platforms are actually observing high web traffic. More organizations are considering to increase their population of their gig workforce. Um, similarly, um, on the supply side of the equation, we expect more in our labor force to participate in the gig economy um, as we grapple with high unemployment rates and changing lifestyle where more are actually seeking flexible work options. The beauty of the gig economy is that it offers win-win arrangements for employers and the workforce. It provides um, companies a range of talent and expertise that could otherwise be difficult to deploy at the end of the project. It also helps company manage um, any additional search and workload and, um, you know, and provides a wider range of talent with what we have just spoke about earlier. Um, we can also expect that the manpower regulations or market conditions to adapt accordingly for the gig workforce in the future could be in a form of minimal wage or tax considerations. And um, these are considerations that we need to be uh, we need to be kept updated from a human capital risk management perspective. And moving on to the last topic on rejuvenating the employee experience. So we have discussed very heavily on the amount of changes that transcended upon us in the past couple of months, and it certainly impacted various parts of the value chain and employee experience. It is very likely that we have imposed certain changes along the way, but we have yet to have time to rethink um, the entire be it, um, value chain journey or the employee experience journey. So, um, so it is actually time for us to think about that with care and during this period, be very purposeful about the changes, articulate um, the new direction, the new visions, and how this links back to an individual's day-to-day -day jobs, um, rethink ways to onboard new employees or how we deploy um, people on projects and understand that it is a sensitive and difficult time. So focus on areas to enhance um, the physical and mental well-being of employees. Um, we see organizations investing in that um, during this period. And with this, um, I will end my part of the presentation and turn it on to the next speaker. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, to uh, CK and uh, uh, Niha for, for this great introduction. And th th thank you also, and Sarah, for your, for your very interesting opening remarks. I actually wanted to um, build on this. I think your, your, the initial video that you showed us um, uh, about the, uh, um, uh, the, the, the main, the key drivers, uh, technology, demographics, and power, uh, power play, I think it's, it's very important. I wanted to focus my presentation more on uh, let's say the societal implications of uh, uh, of t artificial intelligence, in particular, and the new technologies. And I wanted to show you some work that we are doing here at the International Labour Organization uh, on tomorrow at work, the AI trilemma. Um, so talking a bit about uh, societal implications and then bringing into p the picture as well a small association that I'm running here out of Geneva called Geneva Micro Labs that, uh, that actually tries to build on these, these insights and trying to kind of uh, uh, looking into uh, sustainability issues that are related to uh, to artificial intelligence uh, in in particular. Uh, so one thing I think would I'd add to the previous speaker is in exactly that is the sustainability issue that is that is missing for, uh, uh, from the discussion. I think I would like to bring this in uh, uh, into this into this discussion this uh, today. So uh, let me give you some take home messages on this. Uh, first of all. Um, Sustainability is uh, is really an issue that is at the heart of current uh, of these current new technologies on artificial intelligence in particular. And what I mean with that is that you actually have an issue here that you cannot solve the inequality that comes with it, uh, increase the productivity, and still have ecological sustainability at the same time. These are this is what I call the AI trilemma. These are three items that you cannot have simultaneously. Yeah? Um, Unfortunately, I have to say that in many uh, advanced economies, at least, uh, uh, technological progress has actually de delivered neither. We see rising inequality, I mean, and that was pre-COVID. I have some some charts to back it up. We see low productivity growth. Productivity has not increased over the last 15, 20 years, despite the fact that we see this uprise uh, uh, in artificial intelligence. And we still have a high ecological footprint. So we actually have, on this trilemma, we actually have the worst situation uh, possible. My argument here is, and I think that's where, 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 where policy and uh, sustainability connect, is there is a way out, which, which means that we need to focus on directed technological progress. We need to see where are the areas where we can put in artificial intelligence into, a, into use, into smart use that help us solve this trilemma. And, uh, 
uh, and have a proper public management of the data economy, but also private actors uh, in, in that process. So basically a proper public private management of, uh, of the entire digital economy. Yeah? Uh, so let me just go maybe very quickly into the, the issue of what this, tra this trilemma in involves is what we see is and, and we have discussed this uh, in, in uh, you're certainly aware of this uh, this discussion in certain other forums is that first of all we see a lot of inequality happening right across the world now um, we have uh, we we have political consequences that can, came out of this uh, and uh, and uh, there's still not really an ideal uh, a solution in terms of uh, policies that uh, that help us. Uh, and plus, often these policies would run against any increase in productivity. Productivity does happen, but it doesn't it doesn't diffuse. It happens in a very small part of the economy, mostly around uh, online companies like Amazon, etc., or Google. They are a, a highly productive, highly profitable companies, but it doesn't diffuse through the rest of the economy. You see an increasing disconnect between the the front runners of the economy and the rest of the crowd. Uh, and on top of that. You have a high energy uh, uh, impact and high environmental impact of these of these new technologies. So currently, we're talking about six seven percent of electricity to consumption in the United States is going to electronic devices. Uh, the the anticipation or the forecast for for this energy uh, impact will be about 20 25 percent by 2030 2035. So that's an enormous impact that we have, and we don't necessarily have. Uh, the means to to solve that simply because there are technological limits to what we what we can achieve unless we, we switch to a totally new technology of which we see some some controls around uh, quantum computing but it's certainly not something that we will have in our pockets any any time soon so so we have an issue that that we on the one hand we have this issue between productivity and inequality but on top of that we also see an ecological sustainability problem that we we, we haven't really managed to solve huh? and and the question is, what can we do about this? Huh? So let me first give you some statistics, maybe just to back up my, some of my earlier points. First, first, this is here long-term productivity uh, developments for G7 countries. G7 countries is United States, United Kingdom, Japan, Canada, Germany, France, and Italy. And you see that no matter which country you look at, uh, you have a continuous decline in average annual uh, hourly productivity growth over the last 60, 70 years. Uh, and that hasn't stopped on the contrary. I mean, we have, this is obviously everything is pre-COVID, uh, but by 2019, we still saw uh, extremely low productivity growth, including in countries that are front runner in the digital economy, which, uh, which are the United States and, and the United Kingdom. And so we haven't really seen much. There was a, in the 90s, there was a period where we saw a bit of an acceleration of productivity growth. But after that, it, the, 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 the growth rate fell again. And we ha despite the fact that artificial intelligence in particular has uh, accelerated so massively over the last 10 years, we don't see much of that effect. You might say yet, but my, my point is that actually there is an issue behind the, the digital economy that prevents this, uh, this, uh, if these effects to, from diffusing more broadly throughout the rest of the economy. Yeah? The other aspect that I mentioned before is, is very interesting here. If you look at this chart, so this is this stops a bit uh, already in the mid, uh, uh, mid 2010s, uh, is you see that massive decline in computer storage costs, which is just a reflection overall of how how uh, more efficient our computer technologies have become over, over the last uh, 40 years or so. Um, and what is, what's interesting is at the same time, at least for OECD countries, you also see a decline in job destruction. So you don't see an increase. It's not, it's not that these technologies, these new computer technologies would lead to more and more job destruction on the, on the labor market. On the contrary, it seems to be associated with a decline. What did happen in, uh, on the country, uh, on the other hand, was an increase in inequality. And increase in inequality, again, the chart stops a bit before, and even before the, uh, the uptake of, uh, of artificial intelligence. Uh, so it was a massive uh, and con continuous increase in inequality where some people managed to actually uh, uh, um, get the, uh, access to, uh, to, the, to the, these benefits of these new technologies, whereas the rest of the crowd basically did not benefit from it so much or at all. Uh, and, um, and again, the question is, what can we do about this and what needs not needs to be done to to address this. Huh? So let me just just conceptualize a bit of what the problem here is. And, and I think that that gives us some ideas of what needs to be done, both on the policy side, but also on the side of where uh, companies can actually uh, uh, make a difference here. So most of the discussion right now is really focusing on how artificial intelligence replaces workers. Huh? So, so we're talking, most of the time we're talking about job loss. 
My point on this previous chart was we don't see much of this job loss happening and partly for reasons that Sarah was mentioning that a lot of job losses might, might happen, but at the same time, we also see a lot of job creation happening somewhere else. Huh? What is interesting is artificial intelligence can help make workers more productive. And I think, again, Sarah's presentation was really to the point saying, where are these possibilities for making workers more productive? It makes organizational changes, but it also needs some kind of uh, the right qualification, right skills to help this. My point is to solve the to solve the AI trilemma, with which I started my presentation. Is but we need to increase, we need to enhance the system efficiency. We need to enhance the way people, companies, and uh, governments work together uh, in a in a way that helps us to improve both the the overall productivity of the economy, uh, but also the ecological uh, sustainability. One one simple example of that would, for instance, improve our transportation systems. I don't know you in Singapore, but here in Geneva, even though it's a small city, we lose a lot of time to inefficient for, uh, transportation system. Uh, I'm actually was much more happy, much happier than while I was in in confinement at home because I didn't have to do so much right time on commuting. Other issues are waste management, electricity management, even uh, more closely to related to labor markets. The way we hire uh, companies have started thinking about solutions how to improve the hiring process to actually lose less money. Uh, leave less money on the table by by identifying before you actually start the whole uh, the whole in, uh, hiring process, identifying the right uh, the right skill competences, the right skills, and the right workers that will match with these with these skills both inside your company but also externally. And I think this these kind of system system applications of artificial intelligence is where exactly we should focus in our way uh, in our way forward. Uh, now to give you an, uh, an example of the first element that is now affecting more broadly the labor market and that actually might might uh, uh, prevent us from looking uh, on this on this part is that AI obviously had uh, in addition so, so so start differently the the automation pros problem that we have seen in the past was mostly mostly uh, linked to uh, middle uh, uh, middle skilled and low uh, low skilled uh, uh, employees that use them their, their their physical uh, power to to shift goods etc so you had all these automated processes that help to uh, to replace workers that use physical uh, uh, physical capacity now with ai we see that increasingly uh, the patents are focusing on cognitive abilities to be replaced by AI. And you see here, this is a, this is work that was done by, by a, a PhD student from Stanford. He kind of went through the different uh, uh, patent application in the US patent office and looked at what are the, what are the activities that are, that are, that are being replaced by current uh, patents. And, and you see all of these activities in, in the left column are activities that are typically uh, uh, um, carried out by white collar workers. Which is when you translate this into uh, uh, job losses by or job job risk by education level here on the figure on the bottom, you see that mostly this will target uh, people with bachelor's degree or graduate and professional degree. So people like you and me, basically, yeah, that would be highly uh, highly targeted by this by this uh, by these new technologies that are coming. So the question is actually, uh, is there something else we can do with it, or is that really kind of accelerating the process that we don't only see inequality, but inc including increasingly also job uh, job losses? Huh? Uh, and my 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 argument to that is, and I would be I would differ a bit from what what, uh, what Sarah was saying before about the gig economy. My my biggest fear of these developments is that what we do actually see is an increasing uh, increasing share of budget jobs on the on the labor market. Budget jobs is. David Graeber defined it uh, some years ago uh, as jobs that uh, meaningless for people who carrying out actually pe people don't know themselves uh, um, what what why they are doing these jobs. So a typical example is compliance officers. So compliance officers are basically uh, of, uh, people that that make sure that some rules and procedures are being uh, um, are being followed through. Uh, it's basically an, an answer to red tape, if you want. And so you see here an example for the uh, for the United States and health insurance administrative costs. They don't add anything to health to the healthcare system as such. Uh, they just make sure that the the red tape has been uh, uh, has been carried through uh, properly. Yeah? Whereas on the gig side, uh, we actually don't see much of an uptake. Now this might change. You say the latest number on this chart up there is is from 2017. But the problem with the gig work is often that these are very specific tasks that are carried out, for instance. Uh, in terms of uh, home delivery or uh, or taxi services, but if you if you look at the if you look at the attempt to apply gig work to uh, to consultancy services, it's much less effective and much less uh, uh, it, it requires a much uh, stronger co uh, uh, collaboration between uh, consultant uh, and, and consultee. So so we can actually imp uh, implement this type of 
uh, this type of, of approaches to a larger share of, of, of uh, the workforce. Um, so then the question is, so what should we do? Huh? So obviously, one of the answers that is typically given is uh, skills. I mean, we need more skills. Well, clearly, I mean, we need more cognitive skills, or at least to the extent that we need to outpace, basically, if you want, um, uh, the, the, imp the improvement in terms of these uh, this, uh, artificial intelligence routines to, uh, to be smarter than these machines and to, to, have, to have also always a competitive edge. In addition to that, and I think that was that was something that also came very clearly out of the current uh, the current crisis. Is we need social and emotional skills, and these are not skills that you typically learn in a university or or a classroom or or, or it's, uh, in high school. This is something that you you sometimes you have it, you bring it naturally with you, but sometimes you need actually coaching and very different approaches to uh, to learning in this in this environment. But these are certainly skills that uh, that will come uh, that will become much more important alongside technolo technological skills. And if you think, or if you look at this chart, the increase is, is certainly higher for technological skills, but the number of hours worked in this area is still much lower than, for, than, uh, than the number of hours worked that, that requires social and emotional skills. And that will certainly remain for the, for the time for the time being. One specific area which I always focus on in this, in this presentation is they have, you have a specific systemic issue to inequality for the, for the data economy. And I think that uh, it, it's important to bring this to the table and to, to identify to what extent actually not only public sector regulation, but also private sector can offer solutions to this, to this issue. And I think that there are, there are possibilities. Uh, data portability is obviously a regulatory issue, but there are open innovation, innovation systems. Just this morning, I talked with a, with a person from, from uh, Open Geneva who has this kind of open innovation system here, here in Geneva. These are systems where basically intellectual property is much much more easily shared across different uh, 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 different entities, which help to to spread the, the the ideas, the spread the knowledge that is generated by these by these innovations uh, uh, across across a larger uh, uh, part of the of the economy, and helps basically to address the inequality issue as I mentioned before. Uh, then there are much more, even more innovative approaches like data as labor, where you would use blockchain technologies, for instance, to identify who is actually providing the data in order to benefit from it uh, individually. So, so, but these are clearly things where, where private public uh, uh, co uh, collaboration is, uh, is, uh, is important. And then my last point is uh, what all this requires at the end is we need to support at the, at the systemic level, at the, at, the, at, the, at, the, at the aggregate level, we need to support occupational transition. What Sarah also mentioned, and I, I perfectly agree with this, is we can't kind of continue the way we are doing. Uh, but this this requires this requires uh, support. This requires administrative capacity, and requires obviously also funding from the point uh, from those who uh, to have these put this this systems together. Uh, and there will be changes that are necessary. For instance, in terms of the way we tax our our economy, so digital taxation is one one high. Uh, high topic right now in, at the, in the European Union, at least. We also need, and that comes back to the gig, gig economy, we need new forms of social security that help provide uh, social security for the Uber driver and for the for the, uh, the home delivery service that that uh, that can that maybe not be benefiting from the typical social security system that we have seen in the past. Uh, there are other ways of of also profit sharing at the company level, but what's important is that the sharing of the um, uh, of the wealth that is created by the digital economy needs to go through a different different scheme in my sense which requires somehow setting up using these digital uh wealth uh, at, the, at the national level through some what i call this digital uh, uh, sovereign wealth fund uh that can uh that can help to uh, to leverage uh, uh at the national level the economy and provide benefits more broadly uh through the throughout the uh the economy and then the last one, I think that is something which is becomes now obvious almost uh, uh, to, to say this in the current situation is the strength and resilience. We need to find ways of helping people having a broader skill set, having maybe a stronger, stronger support to find uh, uh, ways of, of identifying new avenues for themselves, for their career path in order to strengthen resilience in the face of shocks that we have uh, are currently seeing. Huh? And with that, I, I leave you with that large, uh, large uh, last uh, chart by Dilbert, which I always find interesting to finish with, which is basically, at some point, we have to ask ourselves, is the jobs that we are creating, actually, are these the jobs that we really want to have? Or are we, uh, should we not focus also our effort to those jobs that are really creating meaning and value? And I think that 
especially in this collaboration and, and this collaborative space between private public uh, sector interaction to help identify sustainability gaps and to address them. I've, I would find that's that's where I see a, a lot of meaning being currently created and where, as I mentioned earlier with Geneva Macro Labs, I think we're trying to find solutions that are concrete and to the point to some of these uh, these uh, challenges that we that we are currently facing. Thank you very much, and I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you so much, CK, and thank you, Akhart, for such an insightful presentation. I actually love it. Uh, Sarah, also, both of you have given some prequel to what I am going to talk about and have gone in depth in some of the things I'm going to talk about. Um, so I hope that uh, the audience is ready for a bit of a different perspective. We're going to talk a little more about technology, given that I'm from Dell Technologies, but um, I'm not going to spend too much time on specific technologies, it's going to be more of the approach and how we're going to um, look at the future, what's coming from the technology standpoint, and then what are some of the best practices to prepare for that. So my name is Draga Navara. I'm responsible for emerging technologies messaging and thought leadership uh, as part of our global organization that works with our office of the CTO. Um, currently, I am very focused on immersive technologies, but um, in the past, I've spent a lot of time with uh, addressing unified communications, mobility, and um, just future of work in general. So let's begin about addressing what does this digital transformation really mean? Everybody's talking about the fact that, you know, we're all going through digital transformation, but that really um, is a pretty simple term. What it means is that in the past, we used to have IT organizations as a key stakeholder to the technology in the organization. They were the ones who made all the decisions. They're the ones who ran all the systems. They're the ones who basically were in charge of the tech. Uh, as time has evolved and with the emergence of public clouds uh, and the need for organizations to become more efficient or to reach their customers in a new way because of all the competition, um, we have actually seen the funding uh, for technology move away from IT more into the lines of business. And so with that, we're seeing actually this digitization process where we're literally overlaying our physical world with the digital world. We, we can actually use IoT to document physical attributes around us and store them in some place so that we can create models of what we have around us and then perhaps experiment with something that's called digital twin these days. Now, this is a general statement that we lead with. We do a lot of uh, thought leadership work from uh, the research standpoint. We have actually published our uh, vision for 2030. Uh, part of that is our future work report. And we're basically saying that technology is profoundly impacting how we live and how we work. And actually it's impacted probably how we live even more than how we work because a lot of organizations are taking their time and, and to Eckhart's point, actually productivity hasn't gone up. And I wish that I knew he was gonna have that point because we actually have um, some research showing that more than 67% of the people that we surveyed are stating that they don't think the technology that's rolled out to them in organizations is easy to adopt. And if people don't adopt technology, then there is really no ROI, there is no increase in productivity, there is really um, just a waste. So the whole point is that whatever is being done needs to really be done from the point of view that the end user is the center of the uh, project, that their experience is going to radically drive the adoption. And so if they are having a bad experience, they're not going to be able to get there. Now. Uh, another thing that's fueling all of this is the data, because the data allows us to know not just what's around us physically, but also now we can actually get an insight into people's behaviors, into people's whereabouts, into their thoughts through applications. So that's another source of data that we're getting. And with that, we have these emerging technologies that we have assessed are going to be some of the key ones for the future of work. Um, Eckhart already mentioned blockchain and secure digital le distributed ledgers and the gig economy. Both Sarah and Eckhart mentioned that. That means that with secure distributed ledgers, we can actually structure contracts um, 
for any individual anywhere in the world and have them basically perform whatever statement of work we agree to and have the payout system connected to the execution of that statement of work in a digital world where uh, we can eliminate a whole pile of middlemen. We can bypass a number of things that are currently actually preventing people from tapping into the global talent. And in some of my future slides, um, this global talent is going to become a really key to specific success of different companies and industries, because if we look at the current um, school enrollment in some of these science and engineering and math subject uh, degrees, we actually don't have enough people for the amount of jobs that are going to exist. For all the physical world with the digital image of the digital twin of it uh, through the various data sources that we're gathering, whether they're from applications or IoT. And, you know, we basically do have this big statement that uh, the data is going to be the fuel of all of this change and the emerging technologies are going to be the vehicle to take us there. Um, and so the specific technologies that we're talking about are uh, security distributed ledgers. The next one is multimodal interfaces. And what that means is basically interfacing with technology in a new way. Over the last 30 years, most of us have become really, really good typists. But being a typist is not in a natural nature of a human being. We just had to all learn how to do this because that was the only way for us to interface with technology. But today, you can talk to your computer, you can blink at your computer, you can make gestures, and the more AI is being integrated into um, these systems, the, the more easy and natural interface we can have with our computing systems around us. Now, I mentioned how sensors and IoT are helping us actually capture the physical information around us and convert it to digital. Um, Eckhart talked quite a bit about artificial intelligence and he even showed you how the different um, areas are being used for different purposes, but there are two really key areas that organizations are looking to leverage artificial intelligence today. Uh, one is that business optimization and, and process optimization is becoming more efficient. Uh, and another one is a customer experience and, and really uh, learning as much as we can about our customers and giving them these unexpected uh, pleasant experiences that are going to hopefully build more loyalty for our brand and what we do. And finally, the extended reality and immersive media, um, that is something that everybody is associated with gaming, but actually it is a field that is going to, especially now post COVID, get a big boost because we are looking for contactless interactions. And uh, with augmented reality, which is really kind of looking at the environment around you with the digital information overlaid, uh, we have an opportunity to operate at that cross section of real and digital and, and, and make some significant um, improvement in, in what earlier Eckhart was talking about when it comes to productivity. So uh, this is just something around specifically on AI and the fact that everyday AI services are going to be essential, but they're invisible. There's really three levels of AI that we're going to see. We, we are right now working with our chip suppliers, with our um, designers, to embed artificial intelligence into our technology, into our systems at the chip level, um, so that the hardware is optimizing the performance of the system and software it's running natively, like without us even trying to get it to be better. Um, then the next level will be that process improvement and optimization where system is learning and optimizing on its own. And the next one is going to be really that human machine interface. And I believe most of you have at some point in time spoken to Siri, Cortana, Alexa, or personal assistant of that kind. And these um, devices are going to become much more pervasive in our work life as well. And this is where um, AI native generation concept comes into play because I personally, like I'm also Gen X, and uh, I can't say that I'm a huge fan of these personal AI assistants. I, I told my husband that if Alexa moves into our house, I'm leaving. My kids are much more happy with series of the world. And uh, that points to the fact that they're probably going to be ha uh, having a much easier time with some of these new productivity technologies that will require us to work hand in hand with AI. 
I really don't think that we're going to be competing with AI, and that's actually something that our research is proving as well, uh, and it's documented in our future work paper. Uh, we think that most organizations right now are working on collaborative AI, where AI is going to really augment things that we are not as good at. And those are typically repetitive, boring tasks that don't require very much creativity. And again, to Dakar's point is we, uh, we should work on these human capabilities that are going to be much, much more difficult to work into AI, although at some point in time, if you talk to various futurists, that may happen. So the, the thing is, like, and that kind of begs to a question of, should we really do something just because we can do it? Or do we actually choose what we need to do uh, just to really enhance what uh, our life and work are all about? Um, there's just a quick one about to, to sort of honor the COVID situation and the change it's created in the way we work. In the past, if you, uh, if you look at the left-hand uh, graph, this is something that actually Dell surveys our customers around the world because, of course, we build this personal computing technology and, and, and we're trying to optimize it for the various users. So we keep a pretty close eye on how many people work in the office, how many people are remote. And when we say remote, it doesn't mean that they're working from home exclusively. That means that they could be at a coffee shop down the street, they could be um, in their car, they could be anywhere. The point is that they don't have that office network around them, they don't have that connectivity, and uh, perhaps they don't even have the physical conditions around them. So, so how do we enhance the experience of somebody who is actually not in that optimal space to be more productive? And, and before COVID, we had 19% of the global population working in some of those remote modes, while 24% expect to remain permanent after COVID doing that. Sorry, 39% expect it to be permanent in the, in the world. And in EPJ, which is interesting, is a lot of people, when I moved here five years ago, have said, oh, well, you know, this is not a culturally uh, conducive place to be remote, people like face-to-face. -face. But actually, our research found that 24% of the population has worked, or, or work population has worked in some form of remote before COVID. And actually, after COVID, a lot of organizations have realized that they can allow their people some form of remoteness um, post COVID, so 55% of the organizations. So we're now seeing a huge uptake in our customer interest in how do they enable their employees to have that remote experience as productively as possible, as securely as possible, because that's, that's another big impact is that when you go all digital, security becomes really paramount. Um, and, and so, in order to secure some of your content, you're going to be using AI. And what's interesting is um, uh, in another research paper that we did with ESG, we found that 90% of the organizations uh, feel that they're not staffed to leverage emerging technology. So they don't have enough skill sets. And specifically around AI, 55% of organizations are facing significant AI skill gap. So what does that mean? There is an opportunity actually for bi-directional mentoring in this circumstance because Generation Z or Z um, has proven that they're actually very tech savvy, but they're looking for mentorship from their older colleagues around business practices, around career development. And so they're willing in return to offer mentoring in the area of technology, in the area of AI, and just in general, advise organizations on how to best uh, make the AI use in their organization friendly to this multi-generational place we're going to. Because actually, in the next couple of years, we're going to have the most generationally diverse workforce we've ever had. And when we say generationally, what I mean is, is people's comfort level with technology and their style of communication. Um, there is an interesting fact that, for example, millennials were very text friendly and really like prefer to text. While, for example, Gen Z, like my kids, they prefer FaceTime. They will FaceTime their friends all the time and, and um, play together remotely. They'll study face to face remotely. So they're much more face to face style generation because the technology that they found when they came along and developed to the point where they can use technology 
was more human interaction friendly. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Now, I was talking a little bit about um, the talent gap and the race for, um, you know, that right talent. And, and so some of the, again, feedback that we got from our customers when we gave them a survey was that 42% of the employees would quit their job over poor technology. And 82% say that that would actually influence um, their decision whether they're going to take a role. And actually, I know for myself, I joined Dell three years ago, and one of the questions that I did ask in my interview was, what are you using for collaboration? What are you using, uh, you know, are you, are you Google-based, are you Microsoft-based? What, what, what is the stuff you're doing? Because I know that if I go to a place that's choosing something that I'm familiar with, I'm going to be much more productive much more quickly. Um, and then 44% of the workforce thinks that their workplace is not smart enough. What does that mean? Well, it just means that uh, we're not looking only to have a great laptop or to have a great device, but now we're looking for an entire environment to collaborate with us to be productive. And that's one opportunity I think that exists for the uh, real estate, commercial real estate market that's gotten really negatively affected these days with uh, people deciding to actually perhaps divest out of their expensive central downtown leases is to actually offer more compelling office spaces where people will come. Maybe they will not be permanent residents in that space, but if somebody, for example, here in Singapore, there's no reason for somebody to be remote all the time because it's such a small geographic area that everybody can make it to the office. And, and I think there is a number of research done that the best model is this sort of a uh, flexible model where people, when they need to collaborate with their colleagues, they have an opportunity to go to an office and, and have those meetings and have those face-to-face -face interactions. But when they have to do some of the heads down work or some calls or writing, they, they should probably have the freedom to choose the place where they do it. And, and a lot of people may, if they have conditions to do it at home, would do it at home. Or some would actually, um, for example, in places where real estate is not widely available, Companies can uh, rent some of those WeWork type spaces that are closer to the residences of their employees and not have to pay such high lease and rents um, for somebody to go and do their work heads down. So that's really kind of about having an intelligent office that knows who is in there, that understand a meeting room that facilitates perhaps note taking, the dials in the call right away that needs to be uh, had with some of the virtual members in addition to the physical members. So that's really uh, what we talk about when we talk about smart space. And now just a quick one around uh, this future work report that we produced um, that talks about these immersive uh, emerging technologies. And we specifically looked at it more from um, the field of HR and what it's going to do for workers specifically. And we found three key trends. One is that uh, AI definitely has an opportunity to, uh, and, and not just AI, but like these emerging technologies can help us have a lot more inclusivity and democratization of work, meaning that we can actually source people globally, that we can also use technology to assess not just, um, you know, what is their background? Do they have this experience? But also, what is their natural way of performing? How are they interacting? Are they a good cultural fit? Are they going to learn something quickly? Because I think if we look at today, certain jobs that are out there, uh, they have not existed two years ago. So having finding somebody with this background would be quite challenging. Finding somebody who has a great capability and competency to learn that quickly and master it is probably much more important. And I think that that kind of um, leverage of technology is going to make specific employers much more desirable. So it's going to be a much easier uh, match between the workforce and the talent and the employer. And I think it will definitely also improve the productivity and morale and retention. Um, in addition to that, I think it's important to understand that some of the jobs are quite dangerous. Some of the jobs are also quite difficult to perform. And so providing more of an immersive technology uh, for those people to, to, off, to get like on the job training, but not actually be 
placed in a dangerous situation is actually quite valuable. Uh, offering uh, employees a way to learn through gaming uh, is also very valuable. So all of that is actually giving employees way to master certain skills uh, without suffering and actually uh, giving them an opportunity to be entertained in the process and, 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 and get that really positive experience. Um, but we did mention that a lot of companies are struggling with AI skill set and AI fluency. So AI fluency is going to become really, really important. And what AI fluency means, it doesn't just mean how well I interact with some kind of a personal assistant, but it also means that if I'm a manager, making a decision whether I want to use a specific system or not, and, and you know what, understand how that system is going to be trained. And I'll give you one example. Uh, for example, Amazon, and this was a very noble, uh, very noble goal, wanted to eliminate the human bias from the initial screening of resumes of people who apply to AWS. So they've uh, written an algorithm that was trained based on the profiles of successful early candidates to join AWS. The problem with that is that um, most of the early candidates that joined AWS were mostly men. So female resumes by default got eliminated. So having an understanding of data integrity of the bias that's in data and, and, and making sure that that is not affecting the effect what you're trying to do is really, really key. And that's, that's what really plays into the whole AI fluency uh, aspect. Now, IDC talks about future work in three different categories. They talk about a workforce, workspace, and work culture. And all three are quite significant. Workforce really has to do about individuals, their productivity, and of course, their ability to collaborate and uh, inter interact with other, um, I guess, AI helpers at this point in time. And that is really moving more into the virtual and mobile and distributed and diverse. Um, also, the workforce is going to be augmented. But I, as I mentioned, I don't think it's going to be a competition. I think it's going to be collaboration. Uh, from the workspace standpoint, I already mentioned that people are looking for smart spaces and spaces that are going to adapt to the activity that they're performing. So that really becomes key. And finally, work culture. Well, culture, culture to Sarah's point is really, really essential in, in, in the success of adoption of these technologies and getting really the most out of them. And the best work culture is inclusive and transparent and ethical. Um, as well as collaborative, open, uh, focused on outcomes versus face time. What that means is that until recently, uh, I think one of the reasons that was preventing people from deploying their workforce remotely was uh, the fact that culturally people didn't trust their employees that they're going to work. And now I think COVID has proven that's not really the case. And so how do we retrain the first line management uh, away from from you know looking at their people if they're in the office if they're in the office when they show up and if they're in the office when they leave but technically whoever is sitting in the office 20 hours a day doesn't really need to work very much but they're getting this perception they're very very uh, dedicated to their job so so now we have to reframe the KPIs we have to reframe the behaviors and we have to retrain these people so that's really where work culture comes in. And just quickly, this is an example of how Delta Technologies went about uh, in connecting our connected workplace, creating our connected workplace program. We're actually, uh, for the last six or seven years, we've been uh, a top 25 companies in the world people want to work for. And specifically, connected workplace program was highlighted as, as the one that uh, is the reason for people who want to join us. And connected workplace program is really has been around for the last 10 years. It's been evolving over time. It's not really a destination. We keep improving it, but um, it is something that was never done through a single organization. It wasn't done by HR exclusively. It wasn't done by IT exclusively. It was done in, in concert together between the facilities who are basically looking after our workspace, uh, IT, people who are looking at our uh, technology and how to enable that uh, worker experience and productivity. And of course, HR, who's looking at our work culture and the processes and how do we actually ensure that 
uh, with freedom, we also have the appropriate uh, ways to not just make sure that people are being productive and successful, but also alleviate some of the shortcomings. Because a lot of people today now talk about Zoom burnout and the fact that they're feeling they're feeling really depleted because they tend to work more when they're at home than when they're in the office. They don't have that human contact. So how do you help your uh, remote organization and remain in touch, remain visible, remain connected. Those are all really, really important things to worry about in that future work where technology will surround us and, and kind of make it all um, fluent between our life and our work. And finally, um, again, I mentioned HR and the culture, and we're very, very big on cultivating inclusion. We have a very strong uh, diversity inclusion department. We have um, and they're not part of HR, they're actually a separate group. Uh, we have, I think, something like 13 different employee resource groups that focus on different topics that employees are really interested in. One of them is Connexus, which is focused on remote employees. So when the COVID <clears throat> hit and we had to literally deploy everybody to be remote, uh, we heavily relied on some of the learnings and intellectual property that was developed by the Connexus employee resource group. Again, this is all based on volunteer participation uh, and, and, and people who are interested in this topic. So we managed to have very little uh, negative business impact from uh, the lockdowns around the world and we were able to keep our global workforce engaged and performing. And so with that, I wanted to thank you for your time and uh, let you know that Dell Technologies, you know, we, we definitely are technology people. We do provide interesting security in our products. We do uh, have methodologies and strategies and best practices and technology for people who want to deploy digital workplace. And finally, we also offer the IT infrastructure to provide the digital uh, innovation and a foundation for you to become a digital company. So thank you for your time. And I still envision uh, in 2030 when my daughter will go to workforce, how and what she'll be doing. Because one day she'll be want to be ballerinas, another day she want to be a space scientist, another day she want to be something else. So my idea, which I also try to apply in my teaching to the students, is whatever you do, just try to be a good architect, a good problem solver. Right. So it doesn't matter which job, which uh, technology she will be using it today we're talking about ai maybe at the by the time she might invent some brainwave communication or something like that right so technology will come and go but how do we remain relevant how do we sustain and how do we scale is something is a skill which uh, which one need to focus on uh, whether it's as an organization or as an individual so that's my last comment so now i'll hand it over to dr neha to help us uh, summarize uh, thank you so much, CK. Uh, it was really interesting uh, session. I think um, all speakers were fantastic, and we discussed lots of things on um, um, on uh, AI and automation. In my research, uh, what I study as a, is the effect of AI is uh, whether AI can be in the position of leadership because now, uh, as your slide also said that you know in 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 maybe. 10 years of time, AI will be so intelligent that uh, all the humans will be kicked out. So whether that is possible or not. Uh, so in, in some areas, AI is the best solution, for example, in terms of making decision, in terms of computational power. But there comes an, another power that we humans hold is our unconscious uh, power. So we may not, we may not be, um, uh, uh, we may not be, uh, we, ne we may not have the capacity to have accuracy and computational power, but what, what we have is vision. What we have is the intuition. If you ask leaders, they will say that uh, how I decided to go in that industry to start up, uh, to set up a business is my gut feeling. So what is that gut feeling is nothing but the unconscious power of our mind, which is um, still blessed with all the human species and AI will have a long way to grasp that one. Uh, so in terms of uh, another area that AI should be touched upon is ethical issues. That maybe uh, Trigana also highlighted that uh, we can design algorithms, but 
if the algorithms are designed by us and we have the stereotypes and biases uh, so those biases and stereotypes will be inherited by by the uh, ai and ai will not be able to correct itself so i think uh, humans or as managers or as visionary leaders we will still be relevant on but we have to find our case we have to see that where do we fit in terms of ai and we control ai but not be controlled by ai so uh, that's the, these are just my thoughts as like closing the remarks but thank you so much for giving me this opportunity and i really enjoyed all the presentations all the information that is being shared in this session and the great questions the audience was also very great i see lots of thumbs up smileys <laughs> so i really enjoyed the session yeah. so thanks thanks everyone it was a pleasure having you here and i hope uh, to continue this conversation maybe when we meet in person again uh, i had my first meeting in person after three months yesterday wearing the pants and boots <laughs> but i hope we, we meet you in person and uh, okay, have, i will hope to somehow meet also in person either you fly down here or we'll visit you sometime and ragana sara i look forward to meet you in person as well hopefully very soon thank you everyone and appreciate your time thank you so much Thank you. Thank you.